Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over this full 14 fight card from a DFS perspective. Uh, please be on the lookout for my betting breakdown, uh, which should come out uh, tomorrow or Friday. I usually wait until the last day before the card for the betting breakdown because, as you guys probably know, uh, I like to take into account pretty much what the public is doing, and the more time I have to examine what the public is doing, the the better I can come up with my very contrarian. Um, selections for that video. Uh, nonetheless, uh, let's talk about this weekend's uh, DFS uh, slate. What I want to start with are two fights. Um, the first one being the main event. So the main event is Holly Holm versus uh, Wyra Buena Silva. And normally you have a, a five fight, excuse me, a five round fight. That's the main event. It becomes a fight that you either have to prioritize or really come up with a reason why you're not prioritizing it. This um, this week's a little different because you have a matchup here where you have Holly Holm as the, you know, kind of a medium sized favorite and Holly Holm is essentially where usually where fantasy points go to die. I mean, she, she has adopted a very, um, I don't want to say boring in the wrong way, but, but let's just say a very slow methodical style um, which uh, unfortunately is not conducive to high fantasy ups, uh, uh, upside. Now she can provide fantasy upside because she has now adopted more takedowns than she used to. I mean, she used to be this heavy duty, high, high kick, big kickboxer. And now she's turned into a very, you know, very smart fighter, actually. Not that she wasn't before, but she's adapted to her, you know, to her aging, her aging self and uh, plays a good, a good clinch game and goes for takedowns where possible. And she's smart. She fights usually a very, very smart fight. Um, so if in fact she can have a huge wrestling advantage over Wyra Blano Silva, um, she could put together a huge score, but it's not that likely. Okay. Um, so the point being that you don't have to just pull your hair out and say, oh, my God, how am I going to fade this main event? Um, if you do want to fade it, you can just fade it. Um, is it a fight that you want to fade? I, mean, I do think it's playable. You know, it's, 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 it's not that it's a bad fight to play. It's just not one that should be the top, top of your decision making process. And then on the other side of this, by the way, the Moira Buena Silva, I mean, her fantasy point upside is probably going to come from getting a submission sort of um, just don't see her being optimal in a decision um, because she's not going to be getting takedowns. Honestly, she's attempted, I think one takedown um, in her career, uh, maybe especially in the last several fights. Um, if she wins, she's probably going to get, you know, be able to use her jujitsu and somehow get it, get a submission. Um, or maybe, maybe just just be that much better, much quicker, and 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 just have get some better shots in. I, I honestly don't see Bueno uh, Bueno Silva's path aside from doing something off her back or doing or maybe getting a takedown and getting a submission. But in a decision, it doesn't seem as though she's going to end up being optimal. And, and you know, because on a fourteen fight card. You know, it's not enough just to get the win. I mean, you have to be able to put up scores. So um, I did want to just start with that uh, main event. The the other fight that I want to talk about, and again, this is a, kind of an easy one to talk about, is uh, the Ositar versus Prado fight. Um, so this is a fight which, to no one's surprise, is going to be uh, one that you probably will have to play in DFS. You have two guys that are going to come to the middle and and – and swing and bang, you know, uh, specifically, I wouldn't say specifically one or the other. So like Ozatar, for example, he doesn't come out swinging wildly. He actually is more of a counter puncher than anything, anything else, but, but he is someone who's not going to be afraid to get in the middle <laughs> and, and swing for the fences. And Prado on the other side, he's a little more well-rounded. He has a chance to maybe go for takedowns as well, but nonetheless, I think both these fighters are going to get after it. And it's a very has a very very strong inside the distance line as well. I think both fighters are about plus one forty to finish inside the distance. And at this price, it's just kind of tough to fade. Um, so listen, I, 
you can you could try to fade this fight with you know just to get some some leverage sort of and it is a 14 fight card so it's not as if you won't be able to find other options um but it's i'd say likely that the winner of this fight if you don't have it is going to have i mean whether you have it or not is going to have 100 points and at 8k i mean that's that's usually uh <laughs> it's usually going to be good enough um so if you fade this fight you're really sort of asking for trouble um to some degree one thing I did want to say about a fight like this, and I keep forgetting to mention this. Remember that in MMA, DFS, even at a 14 fight card, you really want to try to make as many unique lineups as possible. Now, unique, you don't want to sacrifice a good chance to win or a, or a decent chance to win by just by in the name of being unique. But it's really, it's really important to not get these you know, mass duplicated lineups. And people talk quite a bit about ways to do that um, without sacrificing way too much. And one kind of neat little trick that I like to do sometimes is whenever you have a fight like this, which is sort of close in value um, as far as pricing goes, you know, 182, 184, even as much as 84 or 78 or whatever. And you know, you want to take one of these guys and you're not sure which one. One thing you can do is to take in your lineups with the underdog to leave as much money on the table as it would take to get to the favorite. Okay. So like, for example, like if, if it's between Prado and, Av and Azitar here um, and you could play a lineup for Azitar and play him at 8K and leave 200 on the table, that's a kind of a, a, a kind of a sneaky way to play because what a lot of people will end up doing is they will prioritize this fight, okay, but yet still, you know, be erring on the side of maximizing their their um, their uh, their salaries. Um, so if there's there's really not a lot of difference between these two as far as their ability to put up a score. Maybe Proud is a little bit more likely to win, but it's not that big of a deal. So what I would do is is try to whether to rule or just to be cognizant of it is try to play Azatar in, in lineups that leave 200 on the table or more. Because what mo what a lot of people will do in those typical lineups is they will use those as their Prado lineups. Um, so that's one way that you can be a little different without being that different, if that makes any sense. Um, so I, I do like both sides of this fight. Um, and if I played one lineup, for example, I think that's exactly what I might do. I might play Azatar and leave 200 on the table or something like that. Um, anyway, uh, I do like both sides of this. Uh, let's now go from, I mean, we could just, just talk about the slate in general, but let's, you know what? Let's, let's just go from the bottom up because what, there's a couple of themes that are uh, present on this slate. One of them being layoffs, and another one being kind of style matchups. You know, there, there are several fights here where you have one fighter who's off a huge layoff and, and you have to kind of deal with that reality. And another kind of theme is that you'll have a striker versus grappler matchups. And uh, you have to figure out how all in you want to be on these grapplers, like for example. But let's take a look. I, I happen to feel as though these fights are pretty easy to deal with. Um, I, again, I, we don't have ownership yet. Um, and it's qu quite honestly, if you want to know the truth, it, it, these 14 fights, I think the ownership is going to be pretty spread out. I mean, with the exception of this, that, you know, Azatar fight, which I presume people are going to pound. Um, there are a couple of what I think are going to be pretty popular underdogs and we'll get to them. Aside from that, I mean, look, people are going to want to get to the big favorites too, but I don't think there's, it's like last week or a couple weeks before where you have, there was a guy you had to get to somehow you know, and end up 60% owned. I don't think anybody's going to be more than 35% owned on a 14 fight card. Um, so anyway, we'll start right off the bat with, I mean, Aline Perez versus uh, Ashley Evan Smith. I mean, here, here you got one right here. You, mean, you have Ashley Evan Smith is off of two and a half years, 37, 38 years old. I mean, you don't even know if she wants to fight anymore. 
Um, we'll talk about this from a betting perspective in a minute, but I mean, tomorrow, but I mean, you have Aline Perez, who is pretty aggressive. I, she, yeah, listen, she tried to couple with, with Stephanie Egger, which is probably a mistake and ended up, uh, ended up getting submitted, but, but so many of her other fights are KOs and, and, and submissions and she just gets after it and just seems like kind of a hopeless matchup from a DFS perspective. You know, like you just, you just really want to play Perez here. It's got good pace. She's probably going to put on a good pace. She's has some grappling upside. She has some finish equity as well. And, and she just looks like a really good play right off the bat. And, and you have Ashley Evan Smith, who, I mean, maybe trying to think of what her path to victory is maybe just her experience kind of gets her a decision somehow with maybe she's a little bit better pure wrestler or she just gets in this big clinch fest. But even so, I mean, if it's a close decision, they're going to give it to the younger fighter with a future. So in any case, except for like 150 max entries of uh, tournaments, I don't know if I would play Evan Smith at all in, in, in DFS. Um, in the 150 max, I probably will, you know, you know, throw away money on like a couple lineups with her, but but Perez is clearly the side, and she's clearly a good play um, in DFS. Then you have um, Charles Charles Deaton against Anthony Munoz. Um, Carl Deaton against Anthony Munoz, and and this fight is kind of a combination of two things. So so you have Ant Alex, it's not Anthony Alexander Munoz. He's off of two years. He's off, off more than two years. Like two years of like four months. And he's a favorite. And I, I think the, the draw here is that he has this big wrestling base and this wrestling background. Um, so the idea is that uh, even though he's off two years, his style the style difference is such a big deal here with Carl with Deaton not having great takedown defense, maybe that Munoz is just going to just get his takedowns and get the win. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess, I guess that makes sense. Um, but, you know, coming off a two year layoff, I mean, it just, it just feels like this fight's going to bust. I mean, I, I don't know why I feel that way. Um, and his, is it inside the distance prop? Let's, you want to take a look at that? Hold on. Um, Let's look at Munoz's inside. It's got to be really poor. Right? Munoz. Hold on, let's take a look. Munoz inside the distance is plus 350 or so, something. You know, Deep, Dean's got a better inside the distance prop. He's like plus 260. Um, but even still, I, I think that this fight's probably a lemon. I mean, I don't know. Like, yes, if 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 Munoz wins, it's probably because he was able to get his takedowns, and I suppose he could win a grappling heavy decision. But he's not the type of guy that's going to be going for ground and pound or even getting busy after his takedowns. He might just get takedowns and lay there a little bit. And I just have this feeling that he gets a couple of takedowns, gets a win, and gets 85 or something and it's just not enough. I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm probably inclined to fade this one. And if Munoz, if I thought he was going to be really popular, I would say just, I'll just take a shot with Deaton for no reason. But I, don't, I just, I think this fight is just kind of, this is kind of blah. You know, the, I guess the only thing I, the only other thing I would say about this is that it does provide some leverage from a range perspective off of that, Ad, that Otsum and uh, that Azatar fight. But boy, oh boy! I mean, for for this fight to outscore that that, that fight, it's just so unlikely. So I don't know. I'm probably going to end up letting other people play Munoz. I mean, I'll listen. I'll play both these guys in 150 max, but in, as priorities, got a feeling it's just a lemon. I don't know what else to say. Um. All right. So here we have for first of the locks here. I guess you know you have Maxim, who's 16 and 0 monster coming from Kazakhstan or something, and against the 39 year old Tyson Nam. Who, you know, listen, he's good. I mean, he's been around forever, and every once in a while, he could he'll catch someone with a KO or something like that. But this is just one of those, honestly, one of those fights where they're just going to bring this guy in, and he's going to just beat the crap out of him. Um, now, Nam does have good takedown defense, so that that so he's got that. Um, 
I have a feeling that that's going to even make Moxham's score even higher. You know, like Moxham, he could either get a get a KO and he's what is he minus one fifty inside the distance up to, to finish something like that. But even if he goes for that big grappling heavy game plan, even if Nam kind of fends him off, it just I just feel as though the better Nam's takedown defense is, the more the more takedowns Maxim is going to have because he's younger, he's stronger. He'll get a takedown and then Nam will probably get up and he'll probably get taken down again, you know, and again and again and again. So listen, it's a very very strong play. Ninety six hundred is obviously a very difficult price tag to pay. But he's got an incredible amount of win odds. He's got grappling upside, and he's got finish upside. It's just probably the best play on the slate. Um, now, if you want to take a shot with Nam with at 6,800 or something like that, just to get one of his one of his one-shot KO lucky punches? I mean, sure. One, one thing I will say about that possibility is that you are going to get a lot of leverage if, in fact, he does get that lucky KO because – I imagine that Makum or Maxim, whatever, is going to be probably the most popular of all these guys. Um, so you are going to get not just a $6,600 win, but you're also going to just get direct punishment to all those Maxim lineups. So, yeah, I'll have a couple. I mean, but his win odds are just so small that I'm just not going to get a lot of exposure to Nam. I mean, there's so many better, better things to do with your money as far as underdogs go. So I do think Maxim is probably the best play. Um, and then we'll just kind of move on. All right, Evan Elder versus uh, Hernaro Valdez. So this one, it's, it's kind of similar, except Elder doesn't quite have the same finishing, I guess, upside as Makum. I, sh I, sh I shouldn't say that. I mean, when you look at the inside the distance lines here, I think they're similar, right? I mean, you have Elder, first of all, Maxim, he has better win odds, but forget that for a second. So Maxim inside the distance or Mal Mal Maxim is minus actually 120. And what's Elder's? Elder's probably the same, right? Elder, as a matter of fact, Elder is a better inside the distance prop. I mean, he's minus 138. Now he might not have the same, exactly the same uh, takedown upside, but... Given the fact that his inside the distance line is just as good, if not better, maybe maybe he is just as good of a play. So yeah, I'll, 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 I'm down with that. I would say that that Elder is just as good of a play as Max was. Uh, now on the other side, you have Valdez, and he his inside the distance line again is just plus five hundred. He's just, I think that in his wins. I, see, there's the thing. I mean, he's only plus 225 to win. I I don't see any universe, honestly, where he wins a decision. Um, Like, like Valdez here by decision is plus like 900. I think that's, that's a terrible price. Honestly. Um, so, yes, it's possible that Valdez just, just is a wild man. You know, he can get that KO. And I guess similar to Maxum, uh, Elder is going to take a lot of money. So, yeah, I mean, if you do want to play Valdez a little bit, you can. Um, just, again, to get leverage. And and listen, I think that – I also think that, that – well, I was going to say that Valdez's win condition is more DraftKings friendly than Nam's, but that's not true because Nam – he's not winning without getting a KO either. So, uh, yeah, I think Valdez is, is totally reasonable at like a 5% or something like that. But there's just other better underdogs, I think, with just better win odds and uh, than than he has, uh, with just as much with with more upside, honestly. Okay, so we move on to uh, uh, the, the the other big favorite. So Jack Della Madalena versus Hafaz. Now, now it's similar. Except that Magdalena has just doesn't have takedown upside here, and and ninety seven hundred for that to be to pay off, especially on a fourteen fight card, you really need not only a, a KO, but I mean almost certainly a first round KO, and maybe just maybe you need a first minute KO. And the issue with Magdalena here is that yes, he's probably going to win. He's a minus you know, 10 million favorite, but his opponent 
actually has wrestling. Um, and I don't, I don't want to make the case that he's going to win. Uh, I might do that in my betting breakdown, but but with the, with the with the for the purposes of DFS, you just can't bet a guy in DFS who's like plus like nine hundred to win. But what you can say is that you know Magdalena has has been taken down. He's not been tested really. I mean, he hasn't really uh, faced like anybody that grapples a lot, and 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 he wasn't great as far as his takedown defense. So it's possible Hafez just does enough with the wrestling and the takedowns to get out of the first round. And if he does that, um, then Magdalena busts, I think. Uh, yeah, he does. He has to. Um, so, yeah, I think Magdalena is probably the weakest, I guess, of those big favorites. So he'd be the one I'd be more inclined to fade. And as I mentioned, half as just, you know, it's just too, you know, just uh, too... His win, his win equity is just too is just too small. All right, uh, Costa versus Lingo. All right, you have Lingo, who's a pure striker, who doesn't really have a great inside the distance prop at all. He's seventy one hundred, and for seventy one hundred, you got to have at least maybe a minus like plus three hundred inside the distance to be a kind of a good underdog here, especially as a as a pure striker, and. Uh, Let's see what Lingo is inside the distance. He's plus like 400 or something. I mean, I, I'm just, I just can't do that. Um, Costa is, I mean, sort of interesting. He's, 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 he's inside the distance. It's like plus, what's it, plus 200? I mean, plus 200. It's just worse than these other guys. He does have the possibility of having some takedown upside. He's a little more well-rounded than, than the Lingo, so... If he if he's not really getting the best of him on the feet, which is possible because Lingo is a good boxer, it's possible that Costa does go for takedowns, um, and so he could make up for that weak inside the distance prop by by getting takedowns. But I, I still think that he's one of the weaker plays. Um, if Lingo were popular, then I would say that Costa is probably an okay pivot because at least you're getting some leverage there but i don't know I, I think you're going to be able to find a way to get the money for these other guys and not play costa um but we'll see uh, I, I definitely they think again that lingo it's, it's, it's the same thing i think that the coast is not going to be very popular so i don't need to play lingo lingo is not going to be very popular so i don't really need to play costa um so i'm pretty much bored by that fight honestly um, okay. Uh, Dudakova versus Nunez. All right. So how different, honestly, is this fight from the Lingo fight? You have, let's, let's compare these. Well, you have Dudakova's a little bit more likely to win, right? She's minus 265. Her inside the distance line is also a little bit better. It's minus, it's plus 170 ish instead of plus 200. And also, I suppose her takedown upside's a little stronger as well because she, number one, has quite a bit of uh, history with takedowns. And also, Nunez has shown uh, some really poor takedown defense. So I guess Dudakova's got to be considered a better play than Nunez. Um, excuse me, than. Uh, than Costa, and you're paying an extra 200 for it. But nonetheless, I do think that Dudakova is definitely in play. I think that she's a little bit worse than Elder and and um, uh, and, and Maxum, for example. I would say significantly worse, honestly. Um, well, she's significantly worse. She's going to be able to get make up for that lack of an inside the distance prop with a zillion takedowns and control time. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll put her in there. She'll I'll put her right below. I wouldn't say she's significantly worse. I I just think she's a little bit worse. Um, Nunez, I, I now how is she different than 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 Lingo, like for example? Um, well, first of all. Maybe due to Koba slightly more popular than Costa. So if you play Nunez, get a little bit better leverage. 
what else is really the difference the, the difference between Nunez and Lingo here? Um, Nunez, let's see her inside the distance prop. Well, first of all, her, her win odds are about the same. Nunez inside the distance is about the same, maybe even worse. So I would say that Nunez is probably a pass as well. I've, I've seen uh, some people wanting to take a shot at her. Um, she did get a knockdown of, of uh, what's her name, of, uh, of uh, uh, Yaraguay, um, who, despite the fact that she got finished this, uh, this past week, I mean, she's supposed to be really good. And uh, I think also people might be a little bit gun shy about Dudakova because there was a fight just like this. Was it this past week where Petrovich, I think, was up against uh, uh, Carolina, kind of a sort of an established UFC fighter against this Russian who's coming in with all these takedowns like overseas or something like that. And Carolina, you know, I think handled her pretty easily, actually. So it's possible that that people might be a little bit gun, sh gun shy to go back to Dudakova. Might keep her ownership a little bit lower. And as a result, it'll make Nunez not that that great of a leverage play. So for me, it's going to be some Dudakova, Dudakova here and, and probably little if no Nunez. All right, uh, Bagdasarian against Tucker Lutz. Um, all right, so this is the, 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 the problem. The problem is this. So, so Lutz has is definitely more well-rounded than Bagdasarian. Bagdasarian is basically a pure striker, and Lutz does have some wrestling. He's not great, but he does have some. He's okay on the feet. He's kind of a generalist. And, and with people looking for underdogs, I have this feeling that Lutz is going to be somewhat popular at 7K. Um, now, the question is, is that for good reason? Um, I mean, if you could get a 7K fighter with reasonable chances to win and score well, then yeah, you should probably be playing him. Let's let's look at this a little bit. I mean, his his win odds are okay, right? Plus, I guess plus 200-ish, counting for VIG. So 33% of the time he wins. Of the times he wins, I mean, how often does he really score enough? You know, his his inside the distance prop is basically non-existent. It, it's 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 got to come from the takedowns. And it's not as if he's a big wrestling heavy specialist. He's a guy that can use them. But I don't know. It's again, you know, if he wins and gets a decision and he gets 80 or 82, are you sure that you want him at 7K? I mean, aren't there going to be other underdogs that that get there, you know, with at score more than your 80? I don't know. But yeah, I guess Lutz is okay, but we have to really watch for ownership there because if he ends up being owned, then we really have to think about this Bagdasarian play. Like on its surface, let's take a look at it. So Bagdasarian at 9,200, I mean, I promise you he's not going to, I don't think he's going to look the same as some of those other 9,200s. So like you have Bagdasarian, I mean, his inside the distance line is much worse. Like it's like plus 200, right? With no wrestling upside. So he is probably the worst, I guess, of all these nine nine K and up guys. But if Lutz is going to be popular somehow, then I think that the leverage you gain both uh, against people from the same price range and also against what could be a semi chalky Tucker Lutz, I think that might make up for it. So uh, I think Bagdasarian could be a sneaky play here. Um, I don't think very many people are going to want to play him in this range because they're just obviously they're honestly better plays, and and we're going to get to some more of them as we get there. Um, so I think that Bagdasarian could be uh, could be a good player. Uh, all right, uh, the next one is in probably one of the more obvious spots uh, on the card. You have Nazim Sadikov versus Terence McKinney. And you have 8,700 versus 7,500. And when you look at the inside the distance lines here, um, you'll see Terrence McKinney inside the distance is like plus 200. At that price, I mean, that's an extremely strong play. Um, and, and you throw in the fact that he has possible wrestling upside, it makes him an, ex <laughs> an even stronger play. Um uh, on the other side of this, you have Salikov, who's a very strong inside the distance line of his own. So he's like plus 110. 
Um, so I think that in addition to the Ozatar fight uh, with what's his name, uh, with Prado, I think that this is the other kind of key fight that you're going to have to play. Um, not that you're going to have to play, but it's, it's one you want to prioritize. And, and as I mentioned, McKinney is going to come up as, as such an obvious uh, underdog because of his internals. And I, I don't disagree with it that that even boosts Sadikoff's uh, uh, playability higher so you can get that leverage against, uh, you know, against McKinney. So I think that this fight, in addition to that Prado ozatar fight, probably the two main priorities on this card. Uh, we already talked about Prado and Azatar. Then you have possible pivot set, <laughs> pivot central here, but we'll, we'll talk about this. So you have Norma Dumont against uh uh, Chelsea Chandler and you know this pricing is very similar to the um to the McKinney uh well somewhere in between the McKinney fight and the o and the Ozatar fight or whatever so if you play this before we even get into it I promise you that these fighters are going to be low owned um but especially Dumont like if you play Dumont here I I I think that you're going to get her at I don't know 12 percent Maybe. Um, so let's take a look at some of her internals and we'll look at Chandler. Let's let's see if we can't get sneaky or or maybe we're getting too sneaky. All right. Uh, Norma Dumont, I, I can tell you the inside the distance line is going to be hopeless. Um, Dumont, uh, inside the distance, looks like 700. Chandler inside the distance plus 320. I just I just can't do it. I just can't do it. Um, so I, I guess someone else is gonna have to make that ballsy play instead of me. It's just so far below what some of these other fights are that even with the the low ownership, I just don't think I can get there. Listen, if you said I had to pick one of these in in DFS, I guess it would be. I guess it would be Chandler. She's aggressive. Her inside distance props better than Norm, Norma Dumont's, but um, they're just, I mean, how could you play that instead of uh, the Azatar underdog or the, or even, or even McKinney, you know? Uh, anyway, very low owned fight in 150 max. I think you have to get some of it, but it really shouldn't be a priority. All right, uh, just a few more. We have Walter Harris versus Josh Parisian. And you have a 40-year-old Walter Harris, again, coming off of a two-year layoff. And he is a minus 160 favorite. And he is about 8,900. It's not the greatest price in the world. But, but the thing is, is that you look at his inside the distance prop, and this is going to be somewhat misleading. So you have... Walter Harris inside the distance. I mean, you need to have like probably like plus 120 at this price to be good. And on a, a bigger slate like this, maybe almost like like pick him. And you see his inside the distance prop is 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 fine. You know, it's like plus 120 or so. But the thing is, is that I think a lot of his win equity is in the first round. Um, I think he's almost about like two to one to finish inside the first round. And that's a big deal. Um, so unfortunately, even off the two year layoff, I mean, like he just kind of has to be in play and I just don't, just not a feeling it's just a lemon again, uh, whatever. I mean, what, what do I know? But coming off two year layoff, 40 years old, I mean, he's really just going to knock him out in the first round. And Parisian has been active. I mean, it's not like he's great or anything like that, but he's been fighting. I mean, as a matter of fact, I, I mean, what's wrong with Parisian here? Parisian is only plus 130 to win. And I, I'm sure his inside the distance prop is pretty poor. It's not that bad. It's like plus 250. Not, not to mention the fact that he can get takedowns maybe. I think Parisian is as good of a play as any in this price range. Like, like for example, I'd rather play him, I think, than Chandler, right? I mean, he's got a better inside the distance prop. He's got – similar takedown abilities and at least here you're getting some leverage um so yeah i think parisian is definitely definitely in play here as another underdog that you could get in there so walter harris grudgingly i'll probably have to play him but i'm not going to play him in 
my priority lineups or anything like that. Um, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. All right, so we already talked about Silva and Holm, I think. Uh, I have no real preference for either of them. Actually, I shouldn't say that. I, I guess I, I guess I prefer a home here. It just she'll get the control time. She'll, you know, she has good, de decent decision equity. But then again, I mean, home has, I mean, Silva has good decision equity also. And she has some take, and she has some submission equity too. So, I guess both those fighters are fine. This Duryea Park fight is, uh, is is interesting because you have two fighters of similar styles, but not exactly. So both these fighters can wrestle a little bit. Well, they can both wrestle. Duryev's a little better at it, but Park is a little more well-rounded. So like Park can go to the striking if he wants to or if he needs to, where Duryev is pretty much dependent on the wrestling. Um, You have a price here of, was it 85 for 77? Yeah, 85, 77. Um. You have inside the distance lines, which are pretty are pretty uh, pedestrian to say the least. You have uh, fight favor to go to the decision. You have Jariah inside the distance plus four hundred, Park inside the distance plus like three hundred. So neither of these fighters look really good, and the only way to make up for that is having a lot of grappling upside. And I just feel as though they're both good enough to to just stop the other one from dominating you know i think it's going to be a good fight i think it's going to be a close fight and i think it's just going to bust um from a dfs perspective so uh i can see people making a case for both these guys but i don't think that that, that either fighter can can assert themselves from a grap in a grappling met in a grappling uh exchange to be that much better than the other one so i the grappling upside isn't there i guess if i had to pick one i would say park just because he is Maybe has more KO upside because because he's better on the feet, but uh, I have a feeling this fight's just going to bust. So I'll probably end up fading this one in my bigger buys. Uh, I guess that's pretty much it. It's going to be a, a really really good card uh, from a DFS perspective, if not from a actual fan fan perspective. But I really don't care about the fan stuff when I'm watching on TV, especially. Uh, I guess that's pretty much it. Just to summarize again, key fights: Azatar Prado. Uh, uh, McKinney Sadikoff. Is it fair to say that the Harris Parisian fight is a key fight? That's kind of gross, but but maybe. Uh, uh, Perez proved pretty decent play. The Munoz is, seems like a lemon. Again, I'll just go through this once again, real quick. Th these big favorites are good. Azakram is good. Elder is good. I think the Costa is probably a lemon. I think that the, I think Dudikos is is okay. This Lutz thing I talked about. I think Lutz obviously looks like a good underdog, but that's that's why I think Bagdasarian is probably a good good bit of leverage there. Um, Dumas Chandler, I just really can't get to, and I'm probably going to fade the Jariah Park as well. And the main event. Um, yeah, I mean you could play it. I I don't think it's I really don't think it's going to be in my in my main buy in my main buy and stuff. All right, uh, that will do it. Uh, stay tuned for the very contrarian betting breakdown, which should be coming in the next couple of days. And good luck.